find ourselves in a message series that we've been calling Epic. And uh, as this month commenced, we began to talk about the book of Acts. And we kicked it off last week. And Acts is just a great book that talks about the birth of the early church and what the church looked like and what things did they do. So if you weren't here last week, we actually... uh, had a great time. We talked about how uh, the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost and we did a little bit of acting here. It was really B-roll kind of acting. It wasn't the best kind of acting, but uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. We talked about what the early church looked like. You know, the they spilled out of this upper room, beautiful experience out there onto the streets and they began to preach and talk about Jesus and what he was doing in their lives and many people got saved. They began to gather together in each other's homes and gather together for corporate worship experiences like we're doing today. It says signs and wonders and all befell all of them. It said they shared in their finances. And I don't know about you, but as I was reading, as I was preparing, what was resonating in my heart is that's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of a church that lives to tell the world about Jesus, that gets outside of the walls of the church, that gathers together as we're doing today to celebrate corporately and worship with other believers and just say, Jesus is alive, Jesus is king. And then I want to be a part of a church that shares in their resources to make a difference in the lives of others. So would you do me a favor today and stand with me for just a moment? Um, As you can see, we've got all these baskets up here on the front of the stage, and that is an attempt to put the words that we learned last week into action in our lives. There's many people in the community around us that won't have a great Thanksgiving. In fact, we've already received 150 requests for food baskets for Thanksgiving, and I'm just believing that Journey Church is going to not just meet that need, that we're going to exceed that need, that God's going to use people like you in this room to sow generously into the lives of others. So if you feel led, would you do me a favor right now? Get up out of your seats as you already have. Come up here, grab one of these baskets if you feel like you want to um, get something. You can grab more than one if you feel so led. And then for those of you who might find yourself in need or want to invite somebody who is in need, the weekend before Thanksgiving, that final week before Thanksgiving on Sunday, we are going to gather together in this place. We're going to worship God, and we are going to give away these baskets to make a difference in the lives of others. So join us that day or invite them to join you that day, and let's watch what God does. Amen? There's a few down here still. God, you guys are awesome. Go ahead, Landon, get you some. I love it. Thank you, thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. God is good. If you didn't get a chance to get one after the service, they will still be up here, and uh, we'd love to have you do that. I want to give you one more opportunity to put your faith into action. On your chairs, there's the sign-ups for what she talked about earlier, which is the Town of Orange Park Outreach. It is a great time. I don't know what you have planned for next weekend, but I encourage you to take a couple hours to come out and join us at our booth. It is not scary at all. We give away stuff to kids. We go out there and we laugh. We put on red t-shirts that if you want one, you can't buy one. You got to earn it. You got to go out there and make a difference. Would you sign up for a two-hour or more show? and join us on either Saturday or Sunday. And man, I want to encourage you. You know what? People that are not believers are not in church on Sunday, right? So I give you permission to skip church next week for one condition. If you're out there at the town of Orange Park trying to reach people in Jesus' name, let's go ahead and pray. Father, as we read about the early church from Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, my heart was drawn to what I was reading. Lord, that's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. That's the kind of church I believe you're unleashing here at Journey Church, this place where people gather together to just worship, to spend time with you and spend time with each other, who have a desire to plug in and engage in small groups, who have a desire to live a life on mission, who have a desire to tell the world about you, who live sacrificially and selflessly as they've already done this morning to make a difference in the lives of others by giving of what they have earned that you have empowered them to earn so that others could come to know you. So Lord, as we go and do these outreaches this 
this month, as we go out to the town of Orange Park to share your love, as we give these out, would you use them and get them in the right hands that they would just have the maximum impact that people who feel helpless and hopeless would encounter you through something like a simple basket or a touch that says, hello, would you anoint it so that we could see the story continue in our own generation? Amen, amen, and amen. So I introduced a bit of a life verse for this month as well as a theme. I told those who were here that we reiterated something we shared about four years ago when we did a much more in-depth study on the book of Acts. Our life verse for this month is Acts chapter 1 starting in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When the church was birthed, this was what God spoke over them. He said, you will receive power to be witnesses. That means you'll receive power to tell the world about who he is and what he has done in your life. That is our humble and simple act of worship. That's the least that we could do for what God has done for us. I hope I can get an amen, right? God has moved in our life. He loves you. He saved you. And he calls you to continue the story in our generation. We said we are. Acts 29. There's only 28 verses in the book of Acts, the 29th chapter. Well, there's a lot more than 28 verses. There's 28 chapters. We are the 29th chapter. We are the story of God continuing in our own generation. How crazy is it that God would want to use people like you and me to continue to advance the kingdom of God? You should say that's crazy, especially when you look in the mirror, right? Myself included. God is good, he is amazing, and his story does continue. He calls us to bear witness. That means to talk about, to make a case for, to share the good news about. The purpose of our lives, as we shared last week, is to live as soldiers carrying out this mission. May our lives as believers revolve around this purpose. If you're a guest here at Journey Church, you've walked into a group of people who are madly and passionately in love with Jesus Christ. He is our heartbeat. He is our desire. He is why we live. He is what gives us the desire to get up in the morning. He is what we want to talk about and share about. A congregation that lives their lives with reckless abandon for the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we pray that you are here on purpose, that God has called you here for a reason, that you are called to be a part of this body and continue his mission until the day that he returns. So today we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. We're going to look at Acts chapter 3. We're going to hover around verse 11. If you brought your Bibles with you today, I encourage you to get them out now. If you didn't, I hope you've got one on your phone. You could use that, download the Journey Church app. You could follow along with the notes or we'll be displaying them on the screens. So as depicted, the book of Acts opens up in the city of Jerusalem. And as promised, the power of God rests on those early believers. They're manifested through signs and wonders and miracles that are taking place. And we're going to get to see the first miracle of the book of Acts as we open up chapter 3. The first demonstration of the power that was described in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. So Peter and John are heading to the temple. They pass by a guy who couldn't walk and was lame from birth and was sitting at the gate called Beautiful. Now, all of us have seen that scene to one degree or another at some point in our life, or at least I think you have. I know I grew up in Miami, I worked in downtown, and not a day would go by where you wouldn't see somebody hopeless, where you wouldn't see somebody homeless, where you wouldn't see somebody that was struggling, where sometimes you'd have to walk over somebody to get somewhere, as crazy as that might sound. It happens in our own city, all around us. Sometimes it's not visible in the neighborhoods that we're in, but none of us are untouched and unscathed from seeing people who find themselves in need, many of which are in this very room. 150 or so which have already reached out to the church asking for a basket for Thanksgiving, right? You've seen that look of desperation in their eyes. You've seen that look of pain. We've also seen those momentary jokes that they're trying to make about where their life is, like, please give me weed money, right? And we laugh about it for just a moment. But there's some sadness in the midst of that because we know that they're struggling. We know that they're in pain. And sadly, it feels like there's so little that we could do about it, right? 
So sometimes they're just looking for money, but oftentimes they're looking for something much deeper, right? So we might keep a little bit of money in our pocket. I think they're going, it, it, with this digital money coming along now, it's, it's a lot harder, you know, to, to, to be able to have money sitting in your pocket to be able to help people out. But that look of desperation, that must have been what Peter and John saw when they passed him by. He looks up and they see the helplessness. They see the hopelessness. I would make the case that there are many of us in this very room that feel that way right now. You might not be lame physically, but man, there's stuff going on in your life where you don't even feel like you could get up. It was all that it could take to get you out of the bed to get here. In fact, some of you might be watching online because you just didn't have it in you, the energy to be able to get up because the world has been beating you down and you feel depressed and you feel like you can't make it. You know, we sung about a little bit earlier, the name of Jesus changes everything, right? The name of Jesus changes everything. I thank those of you who struggled to get here today that you made that extra effort, right? You came here because you were seeking something. You came here because you wanted to bring God glory, but you also probably needed a touch from God this morning. I believe he's going to meet you here. I believe he's going to bring you some of that relief that you need. In fact, during the course of today's message, I'm going to make the case that all of us are lame beggars in need of a Savior. Apart from Christ, we are all lame. We are all broken. We are all destitute. It's God who came into my life and yours, for those of you who believe, that began to change everything, right? who gives us the power and the strength to endure even in the most difficult of times. And guess what? We are in a difficult time, are we not? Did any of you see the headlines of the past couple weeks? Think about it. I remember seeing a tsunami that was in the Philippines that washed away many people that occurred after an earthquake. In our very own state, This week, we had Hurricane Michael that went and reminded me of what it was like when I was in Hurricane Andrew, and the images coming out of there are absolutely horrific and challenging, and people's entire lives are blown away by this wind. The stock market goes down over a 1,000 points in one week, right? The headlines are all around us. There's people like uh, fighting over politics, this whole Kavanaugh thing. It's done nothing to bring us closer together, has it? It's done nothing but divide us. That's the devil's plan, is it not? He wants to separate, he wants to steal, he wants to kill, he wants to divide, he wants to bring division. Yesterday I read, or as I woke up this morning, about Portland, Oregon and and Antifa fighting against other people here in our own states. You know what the Bible says? In the last days, there will be these birth pangs that will begin to occur, and it would be earthquakes in diverse places, that there would be weather-related things that would be really strange, that people would rise up against other people, that there would be financial discord. Does anybody sense that we're in those days that are being described in Scripture, right? Right? If we are, then all the more that God wants to empower us through Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to be able to live it out and be a light and bring hope in our own generation. You should be excited. He called you here for such a time as this. He planted you on this planet at just the right time when all this madness is happening because he's entrusting you as believers with something. You are his masterpiece, and he wants to use you to make a difference in the lives of others. Amen? So he looks up with absolute desperation in his eyes. I remember that look one one last time. Mary Jo and I had the privilege of being in Jerusalem. And there was a little old lady that could not walk that was on the side of the road. And she looked up and I was like, man, after all these years, after Jesus is coming, all this suffering is still here. But then I was reminded of words like the ones I'm going to read. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 6. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. You know, we sung about it a little bit earlier. In the name of Jesus, everything will change. Scripture says, in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Jesus is the one who created the heavens and the earth by the power of the Holy Spirit, empowered by God, right? The triune God comes. And then you know what that means? He's the creator of every cell in your body. So at the name of Jesus, the cells in your body have to come into submission for those of you who are in need of healing, right? His desire is that we would be whole in spirit, soul, and body. Would we start speaking Jesus over our circumstances, over our relationships, over our finances, over the areas where you're lame, over the areas where you're destitute, over the areas where you're in pain, over the areas where you're thriving? The name of Jesus is the name that is above every other name, right? He speaks that name in an instant everything begins to change. A lame beggar in need of a touch from Jesus who thought he simply needed a little bit of a financial handout that day got much more than he was expecting. The king had come. And Acts 3, 8 says, And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. I have no doubt for those of us who are older charismatics, this is the guy who penned the song, look what the Lord has done. He healed my body, he touched my mind. You all don't know this song? My wife does. <laughs> I'm gonna praise his name. Y'all don't know this song? Dude, we are getting old, Mary Jo, I'm telling you. So <laughs> go look it up, it was a very good song. He healed my body, he touched my mind, he saved me just in time, right? God loved him that much. He loves you that much. Where's those areas in your life that you need a touch from God? When things get tough in your life right now, would you remember and rejoice as he did, right? Man, let us be that way. Let us be a little crazy for Jesus, right? Do people know that we've been with him? Do people know that we've been following him? Do we, people know that we've been touched by him? What's that last thing in, his, in your life that he did where you were like that, where you were singing, God, you touched me, God, you changed me. The devil's gonna try to flood you with all other kinds of misinformation and lies to keep you from remembering that. But sometimes we gotta remember just what he did for us. He loves you that much. His healing no doubt creates quite a scene and it creates an opportunity for Peter to preach the second Christian sermon of the New Testament in Acts chapter uh, 3, verse 11. While he clung to Peter and John, speaking of that man, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? as though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk. And I think we lose a little bit of this in our generation because we don't have many gathering places like they did back then where there was those city corners where everybody would go to hang out and talk about politics or talk about um, religion or things of that nature. Now we do it on Facebook and we all just hate one another because of it, right? Let's talk a lot more about Jesus than we do about politics on Facebook and everything will be okay, right? Some of you are happy about that. Let's ban all politics from Facebook. Come on. I mean, there was the public square. They were there. They had this opportunity to interact, this opportunity to share. And other Bible stories actually take place there. Um, you know, in that first miracle in the book of Acts where they speak in other tongues, the whole crowd is amazed. They're obviously amazed at this man who they've seen there year after year, day after day, who can't get up and all of a sudden is standing and dancing and praising God. And in that context of that joy overwhelming, they have this opportunity to share the gospel. And one of the first things that they do is they begin to redirect him. Do you notice how it started? It says, while he clung to Peter and John. Our natural tendency as human beings is to worship God's creation rather than the creator. Have you ever noticed that? We want to worship the person. Peter did this to me. John did this to me. We're on the lookout all the time for those kinds of things, whether we care to admit it. We live by American Idol Syndrome. There's a symptom of it in all of us. 
We look for celebrity pastors or we look for celebrity stars out there who are singers or on TV or in politics or whatever genre we like, be it sports or you name it. We look at these people and we lift them up on a pedestal, right? Do we do that? We do, right? But the truth of the matter is every good and precious gift that they have is from God. And sadly, in our humanity, in our fallenness, all the way back from the Garden of Eden, we too want to be worshipped. We want our lives to have meaning. We want people to say, look at us. Look at us. And Peter knows this in their heart. And when he goes, he redirects it. The last thing on Peter's mind is that he would be some sort of celebrity pastor, right? He's like, it's not me. Why do you stand in awe of this? This is what was predicted. This is what was prophesied. It wasn't John and I who did any of this. It was the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who you crucified. He goes and he begins to tell them, as we'll see in just a moment, he calls them out. He does the least seeker-sensitive thing that you could ever do. He doesn't try to give them all their felt needs and tell them how everything's going to be wonderful and they could have their best life now and their best marriage. He calls them out on their sin. That's a good way to build a church real quick, right? He didn't care. He loved them enough that he didn't care. He says in Acts 3.13, Maybe on his heart is that in their generation, as in ours, people are all too quick to worship a person rather than a savior. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release them. But you denied the holy righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and you killed the author of life whom, you, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses and in his name, by faith in his name, he has made this man strong from whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Pilate was going to release him. But you cried out for him not to. Jesus was a humble, righteous servant who was guilty of nothing, but instead you released a murderer. You killed the very author of life himself, yet God had a different plan. The devil wanted to kill him, but God would raise him up on the third day, bringing life everlasting to all who would believe, right? He calls them out, and guess what? He calls us out today too. Every time we worship these false gods, it is called idolatry, right? It's called idolatry. There's a fine line between enjoying things and worshiping things, amen? You know, I I follow a couple of these celebrities on Twitter from time to time where you see what they do in their public acting persona, say, and then the things that they do in their real life stand in direct opposition to God. Yet we put all of these people on a pedestal. Oh, they're such good singers. Let's go out and spend our money on them so that we can go enjoy this time where we go to their show. Or they're such good actors and actresses. Who cares what they believe behind the scenes when half the stuff that most of them are doing is crucifying Christ all over again and over again and over again. And then we as believers go and worship them. We don't call it that, of course, do we, right? But when you spend your time, your money, your attention on them that is a form of worship is it not and he calls them out this isn't how you build a church (laughs) real quick so to speak right so this is his first message it's not like oh everything's gonna be fine everything's gonna be wonderful everything's gonna be dandy life's gonna be perfect all the time you're gonna be man you're gonna kill it right he says man get rid of the sin that's in your life and when you do you'll find real peace when you worship the one true God you will find real peace All these other things are but a distraction. They're lies of the devil. They're meant to keep us busy. They're meant to keep us defeated. They're meant to keep us tired as a bunch of people when I walked in here this morning are like, how you doing today? I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Anybody relate? Why do we have to live that way? Why do we have to fall into the rat race? Why do we have to live the way that the world does? God calls us to be countercultural. But it's gotta, we got to fight for that time with God. we got to spend time with the King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords. Those people they were speaking to that day, they were no doubt guilty of the crime that he was charging them with. But you and I, apart from Christ, are equally as guilty 2,000 years later. Every human being since the fall of Adam was born into sin. And apart from Christ, we live for the things of this world. We live for the lust of the flesh. We live for the pride of life. We live for our own achievement. And we oftentimes sadly leave God out of the picture. But the Bible says that there's a different way. That he could transform us from the inside out. That we can get up again and leap with joy if we'll only surrender our life to God. Romans 6.20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you gathering at that time from the things for which you are now ashamed? See, these are past tense statements. They're not meant to be present in the life of the believer. He's saying, when you were, this is how you used to live. Something's different in you now. For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin, anybody been set free in here? And have become slaves to God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin are death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We all have a debt that we could never repay, but when we surrender our life to him, it's look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. I pray that some people leave this place dancing today because you're reminded of just how good God is and how much he loves you. When we repent and believe and are saved, the Holy Spirit floods into our hearts and we begin to live this kind of life that we're describing. Acts 3.17, and now, brothers... I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Christ appointed for you, Jesus. They acted in ignorance, and sometimes we do today also, right? Now, I'm not telling you to go out to all your friends and neighbors and say, you sinner, you're going to burn in hell. That's probably not the best opening line. It might not work all that great. But may there be a passion in our hearts to lovingly share with those around us that, man, hell is real. It's hot. It lasts forever. That we are, as we agreed upon earlier, in these last days. And how important is it for us to live a life of holiness and in turn, go out there and share the good news with anyone who will listen. Who will go out there and say, look what the Lord's done in my life. I was going through this. I have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And let me tell you, God will open doors on your behalf to have those kinds of conversations if you'll only be brave enough and bold enough to begin to pray for them. Would you do that? Would you set time aside to spend time with the Lord? I love what it says in Acts 4, 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. What would people say about you? Would they know that you've been with Jesus? Why are y'all being so quiet? See, the devil wants to steal our time so that we can't spend time with the one who really matters. He wants to keep us far from the time that could be spent with Jesus. See, when you spend time with Jesus, a lot begins to change. See, you're walking around all beat up and defeated, sitting at that gate, waiting for somebody to give you a handout, and instead you spend time with Jesus, and all of a sudden you're up leaping and walking around. So my homework assignment for you for this week is to spend some time with Jesus. And that might mean that you need to put some time on your calendar like you do so many other things in your life and say, I'm dedicating this time. Nothing's going to get in my way. I'm going to spend time with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you know how I'm going to tell if you did it? Some of you are excited. Some of you are going to walk in here next week and you'll be like, oh, woe is me. I'm going to be like, they didn't spend no time with Jesus. 
Others of you are going to walk in and you're going to be like, you know what, I'm going through some stuff. But man, God is so good. Your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones, those who you encounter, they're going to know that you spent time with Jesus. Why do we allow the devil to keep us down all the time? Why do we worry so much about all the things of the world rather than the things of the word? I think I shared it last week, but there's one letter that differentiates the two. The word L in world is the lie that the devil wants to tell you, right? That's the lie that he wants to keep you down on. May God give us the boldness to live out this stuff that I'm talking about. Why was he so direct? Why didn't he care about their feelings? Why did he tell them what they needed to hear rather than what they wanted to hear? I believe that Peter and John loved the people so much that they weren't willing to beat around the bush. They knew that time was short. They knew that the mission was huge. They knew that Christianity was a cause worth dying for. So they went after it and spoke the truth with as much love, with as much anointing as they could. And they told them about the signs of the times and the day and the age in which they lived in. And thank God many responded and we're the recipients of that even to our own generation. Would we be the same? Would we be Acts 29 for those who come after us where we continue to tell the story? That's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. That's the kind of leadership that I want to be under. And I pray that you do too in Jesus' name. Now they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They perceived they were uneducated common men. They were astonished and recognize that they had been with Jesus. May that be what people say about us as well. Would you rise with me and bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment. I wanna pray a prayer from Acts chapter four, starting in verse 23, over you. They're momentarily imprisoned because of what they're sharing, they're being detained. And it says this, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of your father, David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage? And why did the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. In our generation, we just talked about all the raging that's going on and the anger that the devil's trying to foment between people. It's nothing different than what we're witnessing here. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Lord, may that be that kind of moment right now here in this place. I speak a prayer of boldness over the people of Journey Church. Lord, that we would be a people who, when others gaze upon us, would say, that person has spent time with Jesus, that it would be undeniable, that none of us would need to be given a Snickers because we're getting all crazy because we haven't spent enough time with you. Lord, may we be bold for you. May we be courageous for you. May people say, look at that crazy person for Jesus because we are so excited about what you've done in our hearts and our minds and the transformation that you've already brought us. You removed us from being lame beggars who were far from you, who were enemies of you, who you welcomed into your house, who you cleaned up our nicks, our cuts, our scratches, the areas that were battered in our life. You wrapped your arms around us and you said, I love you enough that I would die for you. And Lord, may we never forget it. May we never take it for granted. May that thought compel us evermore to live for you each and every day and tell the world about you. I have no doubt as scripture predicts that the world around us will continue to get darker by the day. I expect I come with full expectancy that that's what we're going to witness, that politics will get nastier. 
that the issues that come against your word and what it says will get nastier, that our opponents will get bolder. But what I've also realized in life is that the dog who barks the loudest is the one who's scared. Lord, would we be a people who walk in peace and quietness and boldness under the anointing of the Lord that when we speak, we do so with power, that it's accompanied with signs and wonders and miracles. Would you release that kind of power into those who are here this very weekend that our city would be set on fire, our city would be transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. I don't know what brought you here this morning. If you walked in thriving and on top of the world or if you walked through here just barely getting by, but I pray you encounter Jesus in this place and maybe you have for the first time and God's speaking something to your heart and you're saying, man, I wanna surrender myself to the Lord. Others of you, you have been believers for some time, but the world has been beating you up and you feel like that guy that was sitting by the gate, beautiful, and you could barely get up. But today you feel the beautiful, loving arms of Jesus reaching down with his hands to pick you up and bring you alongside so that you could begin to change the world. If you're of either of those two groups and want to dedicate or rededicate your life to Jesus today, I would love to pray for you. If that's you, would you do me a favor and boldly just raise your hand right where you're at and I'd be glad to pray for you. Anybody here want to dedicate or rededicate their life to God today? I see your hand in your seats. Thank you, Lord. If I didn't see your hand, I see yours over on the right. Lord, I thank you for those who raised their hand. Would you give them a special measure of boldness? And today, would we just all declare together with great rejoicing that Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died and rose again, that we could put our faith and our hope in you, a faith to deliver, a faith that would forgive, a faith that would bring hope, a faith that would bring healing. Lord, we pray that you and your word would manifest itself in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would walk from this place with a great anointing on us that would cause us to just desire to spend more time with you, that would cause us to desire to live a more holy life, that would cause us to have a desire to share your word with others and that we truly would see our city transformed. We thank you for those who dedicated or rededicated their lives to you today. I encourage you before you leave, stop by our next step station as well. We'd love to get you more information on how you could plug in and grow in your walk of faith or simply come up here. I'd be glad to talk to you as well. Would you go from this place and change the world in Jesus' name? God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of it.